Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an API point of view. Tonight, we are re-airing a show on disability from a few years back. We'll hear from folks with disabilities spanning the visible, like Jean Lin, to the invisible, like Claire Light and Austin Tam. We'll also hear from disability justice organizer Mia Mingus and her views on novel ways to conceive of disability and his contributions to the movement for collective liberation. Peppered throughout the show, award-winning poet An Vu Buchanan treats us with readings from his book, The Disordered, based on entries from the DSM-4. Stay tuned. I'm Salima Hamarani, and you're listening to Apex Express. Post-traumatic stress. It's the broken bulb in the back of the eye, the dirt beneath the footsteps, ant hills, landmines ready to explode. It's lip service at the back door. It's a soldier in the supermarket, restocking ripe rifles and tossing around the grape grenades. The gust of the garden hose dripping at the thighs. The camera in the clouds recording every move. The splatter of fingers in the frying pan. It's the wet anvils crashing down from the sky. The army of baby strollers approaching slowly like tanks. It's the listening at the bottom of the stairs. The runny nose right after dinner. It's the way the tires burn at dawn. It's the fear in the ear just before. That starting us off was a poem by An Vu Buchanan, and it highlights one of the invisible disabilities, post-traumatic stress disorder. And by the way, when we say invisible, we mean a disability that impacts an individual's life, though we can't necessarily see it. It's usually internal. And for a number of reasons, we rarely talk or think about disability in the Asian American community. And even on Apex, we've certainly not talked about it often. It's one of those topics that even the most progressive and radical communities have a hard time understanding. Folks with disabilities have been pushing the rest of us to think hard about why we're so scared of illness and really what it means to have a socially acceptable body and mind. Some disability justice advocates are also reshaping what our idea of freedom means and how to think of disability justice and the broader movement for liberation. We have a lot to learn. Um, Because so much of the language around this topic is new to our listeners, we're focusing mostly on people's stories. We met some incredible individuals, and you're going to hear from a number of them during the next hour. So first up, we hear from Claire Light, who, when I interviewed her, was the executive director of Kearney Street Workshop, an arts organization we feature a whole lot on Apex. And she sat down to talk to me about her illness and how her recent diagnosis has affected her life and her work. I met Claire at her San Francisco apartment on a warm Saturday afternoon. My name is Claire Light. Um, I'm the executive director of Kearney Street Workshop, an Asian Pacific American arts organization in San Francisco, and I'm also a fiction writer. I'm mixed race, Chinese, and white American. While we sat on her couch and played with her cat, Claire told me about her disability. Um, I've been technically disabled since I was 11 because I have type 1 diabetes, but that has been more of an inconvenience than a disability. But uh, about three and a half, four years ago, uh, I came down with chronic fatigue syndrome, and uh, that has literally disabled me. And when I asked her how her life has changed since her diagnosis, she says that the chronic fatigue syndrome has severely altered her life. Everything. Everything changed. Here's Claire talking about her experience living with chronic fatigue syndrome. Nobody's entirely sure what it is. Uh, It it might yet be a grab bag of a number of diseases that aren't defined. Uh, It might be a virus uh, that hides inside the cells. It might be um, adrenal collapse. It might be any number of things. Chronic fatigue syndrome is characterized by uh, a whole range of symptoms, uh, but the central symptom is chronic persistent fatigue for six months or longer. 
And, and fatigue, let me just clarify, is not just feelings of tiredness, but also uh, lack of energy. For me, it uh, manifests in essentially three different ways. Uh, the first is feeling tired. The second one, and this is this is far more common with me, is simply feeling a lack of energy. Not feeling tired, but being unable to do anything. Uh, being unable to gather together enough energy to initiate anything, stand up, go to the kitchen and cook, leave the house, go to work, get work started at home, uh, anything. And, and then the third one is something that's called post-exertional malaise. Um, which is what happens when a uh, CFS sufferer uh, exerts herself too much and then the disease sort of hits you back um, and you become overwhelmed with exhaustion. It's harder to to work. So I can I could definitely work I have better phases and worse phases and freelancing makes it um, makes it easier for me to pick and choose when I work and when I don't work. Fortunately for me, like I said, this I, this has not hit me as hard as, as it appears to hit a lot of people, and I can still work throughout the year. It's hard for people to understand what it means not to have enough energy because everyone's energy fluctuates throughout the day and everyone feels tired at some time or another. I would recommend that everybody listening to this go and Google the theory of the spoons. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. But it's from a woman who has a disability which causes her lack of energy and, 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 um, and decreased ability. And she was trying to explain to a friend what, what her day was like. So she gathered a bunch of spoons from her utensil drawer and asked her friend to describe her day. And so, you know, step by step. So I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth, and, and so on and so forth. And um, every time she described an action, she would lay down a spoon. The, the disabled friend would lay down a spoon. Um, at some point, she ran out of spoons, and she said, okay, you're done, go to bed. But uh, but that's how, that's what my day is like. Um, I, some sometimes I don't shower for two days or three days in a row because I look ahead and see that, I, that if I spend the energy on that, I'm not going to have the energy to do something else. So um, I have to eke out my energy like a limited number of spoons and um, or a limited amount of cash. I have to budget it. And, um, and even when I budget it, I can't always tell when I'm going to have it or not. So I end up spending tremendous amounts of time at home by myself. Uh, I don't have the energy to, um, to socialize very often. So I don't go out and meet my friends. Um, I don't have the energy to work all the time. So when I work, often I'll work from home and I won't take as much work as I, as I used to. Basically everything, everything in my life has changed. Um, everything I did before, I was very independent. I went everywhere in the city. I'm in the arts. So I used to go to see a lot of, um, a lot of different types of arts events. I have a, a used to have a very big network of friends and I, um, and I used to go out and see friends very often and was social in a lot of different situations and um, my friendships are all declining my relationships are all declining I don't call my parents as often I don't play with my cat as often uh, it's it's a really cute cat thank you <laughs> it, pretty much everything has been reduced and um, and I can't caretake all the the all of the parts of my life and um i don't cook very much anymore i buy a lot of processed foods which is, is contributes to a kind of downward spiral in my health uh because i don't have the energy to cook it's it, it affects absolutely everything the the one good thing about <laughs> about this illness for me uh, is um i i've, I've always been um partly an introvert and I've always needed a lot of alone time so I'm um, I'm used to and, and, and require a great deal of solitude but I also require a great deal of, of social interaction um, the lack of energy has taken away a lot of my need for social interaction my concern is really more looking into the future rather than, than in the now because um, I'm, I'm very relieved that I don't have to take care of relationships at home because I'm very often too tired to do so. I, I even neglect my cat who's home all the, with me all the time because I don't have the energy to play with him. I 
have never heard any discussions of disability ever. I have been working in the APA community in San Francisco for 15 years. And I have never heard any discussions of disability in general or disability within the APA community. That is not to say there haven't been any, but I have not heard any. It is only really in the last seven or eight years that I've actually become aware of disability issues myself. But that was that was very much a, um, me becoming aware of disability as an ally and not as someone who ever related that disability to myself. And becoming aware of that, I became aware of the concept of invisible disabilities. Then, um, then I got sick and for about two years I was sick and didn't know why. And when I finally got the diagnosis, then yeah, kind of um, recognizing that I was disabled. And I've never quite put that together with um, my API identity because I don't know any disabled APIAs mm. in the Bay Area, that I know of, that I know of. There might be a number of them with uh, invisible disabilities. Everything that would support me um, or would r relieve um, the, the impact of my illness um, requires energy in it that I don't have. You know, uh, seeking medical help has been a nightmare um, because I have to even getting the diagnosis, I had to see five different doctors uh, instead of just one, and um, and it took. It, that's why it took me so long to get a diagnosis. And the doctors are not active on your behalf. Support groups require energy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, education and training requires energy. But I think for people with different types of disabilities, building a network of resources and and creating a culture of accessibility, a physical culture of accessibility, as well as a mental culture of accessibility, is really, really key. And, and I think accessibility and mental culture of accessibility includes people making themselves available to think about disability. Uh, I think that is the biggest hurdle, is that most people don't want to think about it. Well, that was great, Claire. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for, for coming over. No problem. You were listening to Claire Light talking about her experience living with chronic fatigue syndrome. Up next, we'll hear from Austin Tam and his experience living with a learning disability. Austin is a Chinese-American administrative assistant at the Buena Vista United Methodist Church, where his family is part of the congregation. At the age of 30, Austin was diagnosed with a cognitive disorder, and ADHD. Now at 36, he talks about his diagnosis and how it has changed his life. And the last time I checked in with Austin, he was still very active in his church and in organizing and teaching around disability. When I was younger, because my mom was just like, you know, I, we just, well, we, we won't, um, we just put on the, a li, li, put it on the side because, you know, um, I was, um, you know, they, she, she, she wanted me, me to live like a normal life, you know, just like everyone else and just kind of like, she didn't shelter me, but then she kind of, I waited till like I understood more, understood like you know until I got older and had to like you know take responsibility for myself and the the process. Um, I was really resistant towards it because um, it was my I was turning thirty. Um, it was kind of emotional because they wanted me to take medication, and I was like totally against it because I was like I don't want to take medication. And the doctor said um, you should you don't know what it's like, so you shouldn't assume that's gonna be bad. But then I was like, well, you don't know, you don't have a disability, so you know, I think you should be more understanding. And then they're like, well, if it if it changes you, then we'll just you just quit taking it. But you should try it out. And my mom encouraged me because she's like, you know, for my sake, I would be much happier with myself. And second of all, I'll be it would be better on everyone else because it's like really overwhelming for people, and the medication helps me to slow down. And then my pastor um, helped um, encouraged me because he said, you know, it's your thirtieth birthday coming up soon, and it would be really like it'd be like a milestone. So you have sort of like an invisible yeah, it's, it's invisible. It's like still now, I think a lot of people, like friends and people I know, don't understand disabilities because in order. Unless you like live it or unless you know someone who has it, 
oh, oh, you, that's the only way you can say you understand, you know, completely. But, so yeah. when you talk to people about your disability, what do you usually tell them? Well, I just tell them, like, it's hard for me to process and um, process things. And, you know, it's and I don't have any, um, what do you call that? Um, it's not, it's not filter. Oh, no, it filters, too. I'm like, I have no filters, so I just say whatever, which is good, which is good and bad. I mean, especially when I do social justice work, I mean, I just... I'm so passionate, I just say whatever. But then um, I don't have any, um, like, for instance, like, when I'm texting somebody, right? Like, rather than having, the, like, waiting, I'm like, um, can you text me back? Can you text me back? Can you text me back? So it's like, it's really like someone, in order to have me, like, someone would have to, like, tell me, like, you know, you're, it's been overwhelming, you know, can you, you just have to be patient and wait for, like, it's kind of, I don't have any um, boundaries. Yeah, boundaries. Like, I don't have any boundaries. Also, as Asian American, it's kind of like, uh, it's like a stigma. I mean, my mom and dad are totally like not your ordinary, we're not a totally ordinary family because, for instance, like, you know, usually education is like first, but then they're like, you know, as long as you do your best, you know, you don't have to get straight A's. Um, but the thing is, when my mom had to deal with, it was, it's like a stigma, right? Stigma. And the fact that she didn't have any people, she didn't really know anyone who had children with disabilities. So then her friends would say like, oh, it'll get better, it'll go away, and all different things. And then, you know, it's also like um, a shameful, like, you know, in the culture. So that's why at times I felt like, um, like I couldn't relate to people because like, um, I don't know any people with disabilities, first of all. And then second of all, in the beginning, I was like, how come there's no, dis no Asian Americans with disabilities? You don't, you don't hear about that. And then when you see people, like I'm very, um, you know, sensitive. I think that's what makes me, uh, passionate about social justice. And that's, I think was a driving force to my being, um, passionate about social justice activism and, and being a voice for the voiceless and, you know, being a voice for those um, who can't speak for themselves. Can you talk a little bit about how your disability affects your interpersonal relationships? Because of like my disability, I can't. I don't have a. I don't have a credit card. I don't have. I don't have checks. I don't have. You know, different things. And also, like, um, you know, relationships. You know, I mean, like, I wanted a girlfriend for so long, but then you know, it's kind of like, I think understanding a disability is a big issue because, um, you know. In order to be, you know, and, you know, a lot of my friends are in relationships and they've been in college and they have like really like, um, you know, good jobs. Like, and for a long time, I was like, um, because I was kind of in denial. So I was like, okay, I could do anything. But then people were like, you know, we're not trying, we're not going to set you up for failure. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, there are some things that you cannot do. And rather than focus all your attention on what you cannot do, on like your deficit, you, you should focus on your gifts, right? And I think that's been the issue of like finding my gifts because I'm like, what are you good at? I'm like good at memorizing like politicians, like for instance, like when um, different organizations um, have been trying to lobby people, I'm like, I'll tell the people like the, their different voting record, like who's part of the Congressional Black Caucus, Asian Caucus. And um, do you feel like it's hard for you to make friends? Um, no, actually, I'm very sociable. I've, I've, I'm, you know, I'm sociable. Like, the thing is, like, I've, and I talk a lot. I think it has to do with a lot of the, my disability because I didn't talk till I was five. So I'm like, someone, we joke about someone, like, I'm, I'm making up for, um, like, lost time. So, I mean, because um, I have a lot of friends, actually, that work with disabled people. And, like, it's so excited. I'm like, oh, my God, like... You work with people with disability, it's like gets me heck excited. Like it's like it makes me like not feel like alone. And also coming to terms with my disability, I feel like I found my voice. Let's talk a little bit about how do you f how do you feel the Asian American community or Asian Pacific Islander community <laughs> deals with disability? I think it's different and different. Like you know, different. Like you know, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Vietnamese. I mean, I think. Um, especially Chinese, like, it's known to be, like, you know, causing shame to the family. Like, the mom did this, and then that's why the, the child came out this way, and, you know. But, and then I used to be mad because I was like, um, well, you know, it's not their fault. Because I'm very, the two different groups that I'm really patient with are, like, senior citizens and people with disabilities. Like, for instance, like, 
um, we had a disabled kid, and then he had like cerebral palsy, and he would like you know he would talk out loud during service, and he had like st- saliva coming out, and I would be like like wiping his face, and it was like, oh, why why you do that for? You know, he's so loud, and he's he's like has all this stuff, and I was like, well, you know, we open church, we are very. If you're gonna talk about like inclusiveness, you, you have to be inclusive to other people because you know it's very uncomfortable i think it's uncomfortable too because i think there's different ranges of disabilities like for instance um it's harder because because it's not physically it's not um obviously it's not seen it's harder because then i have to i think i have to um i have to actually like be more responsible to like let people know because you know when i was in denial i would go so I went to Laney College and I would come to class and I would be like, I, I failed the algebra class, but I was like, um, she said, you could take it all over again. But I didn't tell her that disability. I finally told the teacher and she's like, you should have told me. I could have helped you out. But then I was like, well, it's I told him, I was like, well, I'm coming to terms with a disability and it's uncomfortable for me to tell you. How do you feel since you've come to terms with your disability? Do you feel better? Do you feel like it's easier for you? Uh, the more I spoke about my disability, like the more like... Um, empower, empowering it would be like to empower myself. So like I started talking at the Disability Awareness Sunday. We had an annual conference every year of the Methodist Church and we had workshops for different issues. But then there was no one of color in that room except for myself. And I was like, I'm not unapologetic for that because when you look at it, it's like when I go to disability things, it's all white people. It's no Asian, no Muslim, Latino, Asian, like black. So it empowered me because I went to the, um, I, I led that workshop with my pastor. And then I'm trying to, we're trying to get a disability subcommittee at our church. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about like things related to disability. I just am surprised I'm sitting here um, talking about my disability because I'm like... You know, Why are you well, surprised? Well I'm, su- well, I'm surprised because I'm like, you know, come to term with it. I'm not in denial. You know, it took, for, it took until 2009 <laughs> to actually, you know, come to terms, you know. And I, I just feel, I would just would hope that there's more of a voice in the, you know, obviously a voice in the Asian American community. That was Austin Tam. Thank you for your interview with us, Austin. You're listening to Apex Express. Remember your name, remember his name, remember her name, remember their name, remember the way home, remember to brush your teeth, remember not to swallow your gum, remember to swallow gum causes stomach problems, remember to match your socks, remember to tie your shoes, remember to bring your ID, remember no more shoplifting, remember to build from the ground up, remember to smile, remember shoplifting will lock you away, remember to be friendly, remember cliches will save your life, remember not to cross the street, remember not to talk with food in your mouth, remember to eat, remember to eat four or five small meals a day remember to take a shower remember not to tell that joke again remember to drink milk remember milk keeps your bones alive remember to make a list remember to cross that off the list remember to pace remember to walk remember to circle around the block remember to keep going remember to keep secrets remember not to shout remember to ask that question remember to get the answer to that question you're going to ask remember the names remember facial expressions remember to speak remember silences are weird Remember to follow, remember to remember, to remember, to remember, to remember. For one of our final story pieces, we have Jean Lin. Jean Lin has been an active member of the disability rights community for many years. Since her early start, learning from the independent living movement, she strived to create a more inclusive disability community, one that takes her background as a Chinese American into consideration. When we met, We talked about her experience living with cerebral palsy and her understanding of being API and having a disability. Jean and I met at the KPFA studios in Berkeley. Jean Lin is the outreach coordinator for Asian and Pacific Islanders with Disabilities of California. 
She explains to me that she has cerebral palsy, which affects her brain and leaves one half of her body weaker than the other. My disability is called cerebral palsy, which I guess it affects part of my left brain that controls my physical movement. That's why I can my right side is not functionable. For example, I cannot use my right hand and my right leg is pretty weak and also as you could tell I have a speech impairment. When I asked her how CP had changed her life, she replied that of all the effects of having cerebral palsy, she thinks her speech has affected her the most. Some people, of course, cannot understand my speech, so they mostly misunderstand me or not taking me seriously. And yet, Despite her speech, the friends she has made are permanent good friends. And yeah, it's challenging with my social mm, circle. It's not easy to make friends for me personally. But the friends I do have, I treasure them. It's not maintaining friends that is her biggest social barrier. Rather, Jean says it's hard to be in community, in an Asian Pacific Islander community especially, with a disability. I used to say that I could travel the world without any fear, but I have to say I feel very uncomfortable just shopping around in Chinatown. Why? Because whenever I'm in Chinatown, I feel like I'm a thief. Everywhere I go, I feel that I'm being stared at or followed. She thinks there are cultural difficulties that lead people to view her disability as a bad omen, or that her parents caused her illness through some fault of their own. Due to the cultural stigma that many of our AAPI community has towards people with disabilities, the cultural stereotype that having a disability meant that my family had done something wrong in the past or past life. For example, when I was born and the they told my parents that I have cerebral palsy. At that time, my grandparents actually told my mom that uh, it was her fault yeah. because my, when my mom was very, very young, she ate a lot of beef. Jerky of <laughs> so I mean it's silly, right? But that's just one of many examples that our folk wrote believe. But despite this, Jean very much wants an API community. She's felt more at ease in the disability rights community. It's made her who she is today, and she's very proud of that fact. Just the fact that I'm with you today, just 
Defender again be able to share with you the fruit that I have gained from the disability rights movement is that a person with disabilities all I want is the same opportunities that that any other person has. But when I ask her she's felt out of place as a person of color, if the disability community was mostly white, she responds, Absolutely. Now you mention it. Yes, and that's why I mentioned that I didn't feel that I would I belong. Like I said, I've, I'm proud to say I'm a product of the independent living movement, but I didn't feel I belong. She says part of her was always missing. That is the Asian part of her, the Chinese part of her. So I'm grateful to the independent living movement, but also at the same time, I always feel like a part of me is missing. I was hanging out with great, wonderful people in the movement but I always feel a part of me is still missing which part my AAPI part what she really wants is for disabled people of all backgrounds to be visible right now she thinks they're invisible we always Hidden within our home, we don't go out as much because we are afraid to be out and to be judged because of us being a API, you know. And in the long run, she wants to develop a strong Asian and Pacific Islander community for disabled folks so that they can support each other in the movement. The community to just lean on and, and just consult each other. I think our social justice community leaders need to take an investment into disability issues and really look into the commonalities that disability rights has with the social justice this movement. That was Jean Lin speaking with me, Salima Hamrani, at the KPFA studios in Berkeley. Twelve ways to look at a pyromaniac. One, there is a man in a room who stays in my head when I am awake and disappears when I sleep and when he says, psst, I have to set a fire. Two, the candle flickers as we wait for father I watch my mother place a strand of hair into the flame, sending a curl of smoke spiraling toward the ceiling. Three. Lighter in hand, a freshly painted door frame, seeing if I can burn away hellos and goodbyes. Four. Chucking a lit rag into the hayfields. Five. I feel the warmth of the flames gathering together like family. Six. The smell of burnt garbage, a broom against the wall, my tired arms. Seven, 
Mother says fires hurts. Psst. Eight. The smothered fire means my swollen hands, mean my scorched fingers, and going to bed early without dinner. Nine. A pile of ash, a missing tool shed. Ten. Advice I can't ignore. Every night I swallow smoke hole. Eleven. Staring at the color of the flames, it burns where it burns and scatters somewhere beyond my ears. Twelve. He says teach and I hear torch. She says rest and I hear roast. You say blaze and there's only laughter. So we heard from a number of people discussing their experiences living with disability. We also heard Jean particularly taking note of the legacy of the disability rights movement and how that's affected access and the ease with which disabled folks move in the world. In fact, all of our guests talked about how disabled people are still hidden away and how they feel invisible and sometimes isolated. So up next, we hear from Mia Mingus, who reminds us that we are still at the beginning of a new movement and that, yes, disabled people are being segregated and isolated still in basements and homes, but that we're at the tip of an emergence into the limelight for disabled people. I love this interview because it really builds on the legacy of disability rights, but it ultimately goes far beyond it and thinks about something else, which is called disability justice. Um, That is, it's a very different and a completely unique contribution that disability thought has made to our movement work. And it really asks how we can radically change the way we think about social justice. So up next, we have Mia Mingus. Hi, my name is Mia Mingus. And I am a disability justice uh, activist and I do predominantly do a lot of writing and speaking. Um, I got involved in disability justice uh, mostly because it didn't exist when I was uh, coming up. In this moment in time, I feel like we're really at the beginning of what disability justice actually is. Um, So disability justice is, uh, the way that I talk about it is it's a multi-issue political understanding of disability. So really, it's, it's not just a single issue way of understanding disability. So when we talk about disability, it's not just, you know, um, we need to fight for these rights for disabled people, but it's grow it's grown out of the lived experience of people who have multiple breast identities, specifically disabled people of color, who are queer, who are trans, who are immigrants, um, disabled folks who are living in poverty, who are parents, who are HIV positive, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's a super exciting time because we're we're at the beginning of what will evolve, hopefully, into being this like living, breathing, consistently changing framework that could actually, I think, has the potential to hold a lot more of us than any framework that I've ever seen or experienced. Um, and that's also because I think disability is so unique as like a as an issue, as a form of oppression that's not like a lot of other um, oppressions that we face. Um, and and then within that, I do like my own passions are within disability justice work is a lot around interdependency and what it means to have bodies that need and what it means to need other people and to not have the luxury of just like, you know, cutting people off or just if wa- having fights with people and finding new friends, you know, and deciding that you're like what it means for people who don't have agency and for people who actually um, can't hide need and that it, living in a culture where we're so all so we're all fed and sold that being an individual and being ruggedly you know like making it on your own and not having to rely on anybody that that's like the most desirable thing and what happens to bodies who don't, don't fit into that and, and who can't pretend to even fit into that but in general though like I also feel really passionate about pushing against the medical industrial complex. And I see the MIC, the medical industrial complex, similar to the prison industrial complex, as a place where we can build and forge like really amazing, strong and new coalitions that I don't think have been built yet. Um, And that can really question, not only demand transformation to the current systems that we have within the medical world, but also really start to grapple with like, what would alternatives look like? What does well-being look like? 
I mean, what does health and well-being look like for disabled people, particularly disabled queer people of color, for example? What does that even mean when so much of our health system and even our alternative health system are built on really, really ableist notions of what healing and curing and wellness even mean? And I don't want to undermine how profound it was to even move away from, like, my body might be wrong to there some, might be something wrong with the world. Like, that's profound and huge. And I really have a lot of deep respect for the disability rights movement for even getting us there. And I think that we have to go farther. And when we talk, have conversations about medicine, about science, about what about what medical care, for example, looks like or how we want to engage it with hospitals, with our doctors, with our nurses, practitioners, et cetera. I think that there's a lot of complexity there and it's not as easy as just saying like, you know, and I'm certainly, I am certainly not saying like medicine and science are bad and we should never use them. I think it's not as easy as just saying that. I think it's more about figuring out you know, just as all oppressed groups have to do, like how do we build the world that we want in the same way that we're forced to rely on the same on the systems that we currently have that are destroying us? And what what does that push and pull look like? And I think all oppressed communities are living in that place where there it's not about choices necessarily, because so many of us rely on the very things that are hurting us and harming us every day and that are literally destroying our bodies and our communities and our sense of self and our power. And we know that we can't survive. Like, they're the things that are getting us through the night. They're the reasons why our communities are making it to the next morning. So I I, I feel like it's, a, it's such a huge conversation and I think it should include healing justice activists as well. Like, it's not just about people with disabilities. It has to include our caregivers. It has to include the, the communities that we rely on and the people that we rely on who also are part of making sure that we make it through the evening and make it through the night and see another sunrise. That's so cheesy, but like, and make sure that we see another day. Um, so I, I think that there's like, I feel really excited that there's so much diversity and, I mean, just to be frank, just like any other oppression, there's a lot of internalized ableism that happens within disabled folks. And I know I have a lot that I work through every day. Um, you know, I, this, I am a queer disabled woman of color. That I have internalized sexism. I have internalized misogyny and racism, all of those things. So, you know, I also don't want to say that, like, I think there's also this... Um, peace in disability justice work because it's so new to just be like anything disabled people say is totally awesome and it's totally right and it's like no you know we're complex human beings too and we're not perfect and we shouldn't be striving for that either like really this is about articulating a way to understand our lives that's not just about tragic or sad or something that's pitiful like this is about articulating a way to understand our lives that's actually about being human and what that means and that means that we are complex you know I, I think that we need to remember that we're still so much at the beginning of our history like this historical moment is is literally just a hair away from the majority of our history where disabled people have been locked up and hidden away and not really allowed into the public sphere, not allowed to go to school, not allowed to get jobs, not allowed to access transportation because it was an accessible period. You know, like we, we have to remember like how close to that we still are and that, e that even still today, the majority of us are not in the public sphere and the majority of us are still literally chained to beds in the back rooms of our parents' houses, are still literally hidden away from the public, are in group homes or psychiatric wards or in prisons, you know, are, are incarcerated in other ways. the disability rights community to be predominantly white and I remember when I looked into doing disability or political disability work in the beginning I that was one of the reasons why I came to disability justice was because um, when I would go to disability spaces political disability spaces they were predominantly white and they they didn't really have an analysis on race and analysis on class or gender or sexuality um, and then when I would be in social justice spaces where there were really sharp analyses of race class and gender and you know immigration status and all of these different pieces and colonization and militarization and prison abolition and all of that but across the board they consistently lacked a political sharp political understanding of disability even like seasoned organizers and activists whom I really 
respected and continue to respect and have deep respect for had like no ground or grounding in what it meant to understand disability from a radical politic. Disability rights to me is a largely based in like messages around like equality and very rights based. So messaging like, you know, we're just as good as you. That's why we deserve equal rights. And so there's this idea of, you know, kind of expanding the ranks of the privilege and just adding in a few disabled people. And usually those disabled people who get added in are people who are white, who are male, who are cisgendered, who are have specific types of disabilities that are more, you know, palatable or more user-friendly. Um, and I think a disability justice framework or a justice framework is actually saying, you know, actually we don't, we're different and we like that. We don't want to be just like you because in order to be like you, it would require that we have a level of privilege that relies on other people's exploitation. And we don't want to just expand the ranks of the privilege and add a, couple, add a few more people in there. We actually want to dismantle the whole system and talk about what redistribution would look like and challenge why some people are consistently at the bottom. I think there's tremendous um, work being done around care collectives that people are trying to do and you know not perfectly stumbling along making a lot of mistakes having some victories too that is an example of something that I feel like is work that is so needed but oftentimes not seen as political work not only because of the ableism but because of misogyny all of those things and I think there's so much that particularly disabled queer people bring to the table around disability justice even just you know just as an example of like what an alternative could look like and what our communities can be so the care collective work I think about the healing justice work for a lot of us interdependency right now is like oh we find you know we have we'll have a collective and everybody will pull their own weight and it'll be great and we'll all be equal but it's like what does it mean when justice does not equal sameness and equality and i think you know what does it look like when there's one person who maybe can't work at all maybe and maybe is you know maybe they have to stay laying in their bed and that is what their life looks like how do we move together how do we do work how do we do work well together? The caregiver relationship and the way that, because of ableism, the way that care gets set up for disabled people is it gets up in such a dominant and subordinate way that it's like fertile ground for violence and abuse and all kinds of harm to happen. And I think like that kind of experience where well, you literally cannot leave even if you wanted to. Do you know what I'm saying? What do you do when you cannot? You you cannot call for help. You cannot do anything else. So I think like, yeah, that type of like not having the choice to be interdependent and obviously not in those senses, not in a liberatory way. Like we want it to be liberatory, of course. But I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot that we can offer in that sense. Again, that was Mia Mingus speaking with Apex about the role of disability analysis and social justice movements. Our music in the segment was sampled from your jabbers. You've been hearing poet Anvu Buchanan reading from his book, The Disordered. Now contributor Robin Takayama delves into the story behind the book. You were saying that if people just looked at the book, picked it up at the at the bookstore, the local bookstore, of course, mm -hmm. um, they kind of wouldn't know what to make of it, right? Like the titles that you've read for the poems are not on the t on the pages of the book. So what was the thinking behind that? So that was um, a discussion between my editor and I about allowing the reader and the poems to kind of work itself. Um, so we felt that if we had titles for the poems that they kind of would lead the, the reader in a certain direction. Oh, so it's an OCD poem, so I'm going to expect this and that. And so we kind of wanted to make the reader work for it and kind of earn it more. And then in the back of the book, you'll notice there's an index and an appendix of the titles. And that was my idea in response to his um, suggestion of taking away the titles, because it goes back to the original idea of turning this book into a kind of a scientific poetic text. And that's what, you know, a lot of these scientific manuals 
are, especially the DSM-4, which was the inspiration for, behind the book, was to kind of reference the titles, to have that appendix there so that they could go back. And so I've had a lot of friends read the book and say, oh, I didn't realize what it was until I got to the end and I saw the titles, and I, I really enjoyed it. I was really lost in the beginning, but like having that t- the titles at the end to reference back. So I'm really glad I included the titles because people would can be completely lost. Oh, no, did we need to say spoiler alert then before we... Yeah. <laughs> So spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> the collection is about psychological disorders um, because I've, I, I, one of the writers that actually wrote a blurb for the book, uh, I won't mention his name, but he had no idea it was about psychological disorders and he wrote a blurb for the book. And so I thought that was really interesting. And for me, that's what's beautiful about poetry is you don't really have to know what's going on to get something beautiful out of it. And that's what I taught my students all the time is if you just get an image or a line or a sound from a poem and that's what you take from it, then... I think poetry is doing its job. So let's back up. Um, can you talk about how your idea to base a book on the, say it again, DSM? DSM-4. Okay, so can you... Um, Which dis- is now the DSM-5, actually. They updated it. Oh. The APA updated it. Yeah, so so tell us how you got you came around to, to basing your uh, book of poetry on that. So it all started way back when, when I was actually an undergrad, and I was a psych major um, at Virginia Tech. And so I've always been interested in psychology. Um, my goal was actually, instead of writing and uh, being a teacher, was to actually be a social worker and kind of do good in the world that way. Um, and so when I got to grad school at San Francisco State, we were thinking about you know your thesis. And it was actually in a class called uh, Writers on Writing. I was working with uh, Trung Tran, the poet, and he talked about you know starting a project or a book uh, that's that, that's your passion about. And so I felt always a connection to uh, psychology and just psychological disorders because I, f- I feel like I have a few of myself and I could relate. And so that's kind of where it started. Uh, the first poem I ever wrote, The Hypochondriac, was about me basically and my... Um, Every time I get sick, I think I have a certain disease and I freak out and I'm on WebMD looking up the symptoms of the thing. And so it was kind of my idea of writing about myself, but not such a cliche. Oh, I'm, I'm Asian American, so I have to write about the Asian American experience. Um, it was, I'm Asian American, but I can write about other things, th- things I'm passionate about, things that don't, don't have to put me in a certain box. And so that's kind of where it started. And then, so my original intention was the book with the book was to actually write a poem for every psychological disorder out there. And there's like, you know, a lot. So that became kind of overwhelming. So I kind of cut it down to just the poems and the disorders that I felt a personal connection to or something that I was interested in or something where I felt like I could do the disorder justice. So there's a lot of poems I wrote that I just felt like weren't genuine to the disorder or just didn't feel like disorder that I cut out of the book. I don't know how much you want to share, but, you know, like, it's it, it could be seen a little flippant to be like, oh, I feel like I have all these disorders, like, because people really do yeah, have them. So absolutely. I just, like, have you been diagnosed with any specific? No, no, one? obviously I'm not. I mean, I feel, I feel like I actually, if I went to get, you know, um, to me, a psychologist that I could, because I have really, actually really bad anxiety. So I know that that's not something I'm, like, over-exaggerating about, like. My anxiety is kind of paralyzing sometimes, and that's kind of where it started. But these other things, like I do have OCD tendencies, and that's kind of where it started. Like, you know, people are thinking I'm over exaggerating, but for like a full year, I couldn't leave the house without checking the doorknob 10 times. Like, I had to do it 10 times every time before I left. And so I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Like, luckily, like these behaviors went away, but, you know, I'm not trying to take away the people that, like, a good friend of mine actually has OCD. Um, and he actually has to like wash his hands like 30 times a day. So that was kind of my worry with the um, project too, was people with disorders were thinking I was kind of exploited or something like that. But it was just the inspiration behind it. Um, and actually for me, the biggest compliment for the book isn't, oh, I love that poem. It's actually when someone actually has that disorder and they read the poem and they say, you hit it on the spot. And a lot of the book, I, I wasn't just basing on nothing. Like I did a lot of research for this book. I read a lot of case studies. I read a lot of things on each disorder before I wrote the poem on the disorder. Um, so it wasn't just based on my imagination. I did like a lot of research, too. Again, that was poet Anvu Buchanan. And you can visit anvubuchanan.com for his writing and for upcoming events. To purchase his book, The Disordered, visit sunnyoutside.com. And now it's time for the community calendar. March 24th through April 23rd, the display group exhibition 
hosts artists with and without disability, claim and define their own identity, experiment, and make their own rules. On April 16th, join us at the Employment Equity in the Arts for People with Disabilities, which is where Bay Area Arts Access facilitates a workshop about employment equity in the arts for people with disabilities. And that's at Soma Arts. Those last two are not Asian-specific, but they're important because of the topic of the show. Tonight, after the show, from 6 to 9 at the Asian Art Museum, join us. I will be there for Asian Americans in the new racial justice movement. So you'll be joining Asian American and African American leaders, thinkers, and organizers in a conversation focused on the current civil rights crisis, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the connections between their experiences. Join Kearney Street Workshop for a four-part writing workshop exploring the sacred places where our poetic sense of community blossoms and grows. Guided by Tony Robles, participants will write about their sense of home, sense of self, and sense of place. That's Saturday, starting April 4th from 1 to 3. The Center for Political Education and the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas Initiative will hold a five-week class comparatively examining third world liberation movements in Africa, Latin America, and the Arab world and reviewing debates about post-colonial studies and the relevance of such intellectual projects to the post-colonial world. That's at 518 Valencia, starting on April 6th. For more information on the community calendar, to subscribe to our podcast or listen to our archives, hit up our website, apexexpress.org. Are you into community issues? We're recruiting for new members of the Apex crew. If you have a show idea, or if you'd like to get involved with our collective... Email us at apex at kpfa.org. Apex Express is produced by Marie Che, Ellen Choi, Tara Darabji, Salima Hamarani, Roselli Yano, Carl Jabangda Singh, RJ Lozada, Preeti Mangala Shekar, Robin Takayama, Yvonne Tran, and Michael Yoshida. I've been your host, Salima Hamarani. Our intro and outro music is by Asian Crisis. Next up is The Bonnie Simmons Show.